Well, hello there, and welcome to our second set of lectures in Introduction to Psychology. Again, my name is Professor Maggie Shafrar, and what we'll be talking about in today's lecture is all the different ways in which research psychologists identify um, and elaborate on psychological principles and theories. So we'll talk about um, the experimental method, why psychologists can't always use the experimental method, um, and we'll also talk about correlational approaches um, and all sorts of other aspects of research methodology. So welcome. Okay, so let's start. What is an experiment? Well, in science, experiments are the gold standards. They are what we want to see conducted. So in an experiment, you start off with a, a hypothesis or a, a question. A hypothesis could be, um, I think all, I propose that all people who have the first name of Maggie are right-handed. That's my hypothesis. Um, then what I do to try to figure out if um, that hypothesis is reasonable or just crazy is I can design an experiment that I can use to test the idea. So the really important part about science is that the ideas are testable. Right? You can test them. Um, once you develop an experiment, you run the experiment and you draw some conclusions. So let's say I looked at all of the people in California named Maggie and looked at, what was that I said again, they're right-handed or something, so tested their handedness and um, analyzed the data and now I have to draw a conclusion and that conclusion will be, well, no, the name Maggie and handedness have nothing to do with each other. Right? So then I have to go back and revisit my hypothesis and say either that hypothesis is a bunch of garbage or eh, maybe I just didn't think about it in the right way and I need to design it. So the important thing about experiments is that you can test cause and effect. Now, I told you that experiments are the gold standard in science, but I also mentioned that psychologists don't always use experimental methods. And the question is, why? Um, and we're going to run through a couple of hypotheticals um, to see if you can figure out why that is. So let me propose a study. Um, let's say a researcher wanted to determine whether air pollution caused uh, negative impacts on the health of children. So is it unhealthy for children to live in a polluted environment? So, okay, experiments are the gold standard, so let's do an experiment. So we have 40 two-year-olds, and we're going to take half of those kids, so 20 of them, and we're going to raise 20 of them in a healthy, unpolluted environment. And then we'll take the other 20 kids, and we'll raise them in a polluted, unhealthy environment. We'll let them live there. Let's say we move their families there, too. Um, and we wait 10 years, and then we bring all 40 children back together. Now they'd be 12-year-olds. Uh, and we run a series of medical tests, and we look at uh, the healthiness of the kids rated in, raised in the polluted environment versus the healthiness of the kids rated in the healthy environment. It'd be, it would be nice to prove that pollution is a bad, unhealthy thing, but what would be the problem with testing that idea in this way? Think about it. What's wrong with this study? Is there a little place in the pit of your stomach that says, ooh, that sounds weird? How ethical would it be to take 20 children and raise them in a place that you have good reason to believe will harm them? Mm, you can't do it. You cannot raise people, uh, you cannot conduct experiments that harm people. So that's number one. That's basic research ethics. Um, another, I'm going to give you another example of a situation where uh, experimental methodology is not a good idea. Um, and this is going to be a study on something called syphilis. 
And syphilis is a disease that's transmitted sexually and left untreated, um, it causes these really painful rashes and warts after a couple months. And eventually the, the bleeding and the scabbing is not just on the outside of the body, it's also on the inside of the body. And if you leave it untreated long enough, you can kill someone. Um, mothers, uh, pregnant women who have syphilis can pass it on to their offspring. So it's um, something that you don't hear too much about now because it's easily treated. But um, in the old days, let's imagine that there was a researcher who wanted to know, well, what happens to syphilis if it's never treated? So how would you do this proposed study? Well, you could find men who have syphilis. You know they have syphilis, but you don't tell them they have syphilis. And you let them go about their lives and see what happens. Would that be an okay study? Why or why not? This might be another one where your stomach is saying, what? You know that someone has a disease that's communicable and causes great harm and you don't tell them? That doesn't sound right. Well, you're right. That is an unethical study. And one of the low points in the history of American science is that that study actually was conducted. It was called the Tuskegee Syphilis Study. It was started back in 1932 um, American scientists um, from the uh, Office of Public Health Services recruited 600 African American men. 400, about 400 of those men had syphilis, 200 did not. Um, of the 400 men who had syphilis, none of them was told that they had syphilis. They were told that they had something sort of vague, bad blood, um, but that she, because the U.S. government is so great, um, we're going to give you, as part of this study, free medical exams and free meals. What could be wrong with that? So the study is going along 1932. The 30s are happening. You could say, well, actually in the 30s, syphilis, there wasn't very good treatment or effective treatment for syphilis, so maybe it wasn't too or as unethical, there's a problem. 1945, something called penicillin is discovered and penicillin cures syphilis. So you would think an honorable scientist at this point would at the very least say, okay, stop the study. We can treat everybody now with penicillin and let's look at our results. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. The study continued until 1942. So it continued for 40 years. Uh, and during those 40 years, none of the men with syphilis were treated with their disease. Instead, unknowingly, they transmitted syphilis to their partners and they suffered significant bodily damage. The study only ended in 1972 because a journalist found out about it and broke the story open. There was so much dismay over this study and sadly a few others that um, the government got together and decided this is crazy. We have to define um, some ethics in psychological research. The first principle is if you're conducting studies in, related to psychology or any of the biomedical sciences, if you're conducting studies with humans, you cannot harm them. You also have to think very carefully about the potential risks to them relative to the potential benefits. So right now the US government is doing that risk benefit analysis when it comes to looking at COVID vaccines. Do we give more people COVID vaccines um, before having thoroughly tested them? This is a big question. Um, in any study of psychology, you have to respect human dignity. Um, you have to respect people's privacy. You can't uh, conduct a study and then tell people, oh, did you know that Joey, blah, 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 can't do it. Privacy has to be ma maintained at all costs. Um, if you're working with children or special populations, there's a whole extra set of precautions that you have to take into account. 
So the Tuskegee study is infamous for being a huge violation of morality and um, basic principles of human rights related to experiments with people. I mentioned that the Tuskegee study only stopped in 1972. Um, in this slide here, you can see the article from the New York Times uh, that um, let uh, America know about the horrors of how these African-American men were mistreated by scientists. Um, that was 1972. It wasn't until 1997 that the U.S. government apologized to these men and their families for what they had done to them. Uh, 1997, the president then said, the United States government did something that was wrong, deeply, profoundly, morally wrong. It was an outrage to our commitment to the integrity and equality for all of our citizens, and I am sorry. I want to tell you about one more study that highlights the pitfalls that can happen when we conduct experiments with human beings. Since the dawn of thought about cognition and psychology, people have wondered, what's the relationship between nature versus nurture? How much of who you are is defined by your genetic makeup, your nature, and how much of who you are is defined by the experiences that you had as a child and an adult, your environment, nurture? Unfortunately, someone came up with an idea of conducting a study to figure out the relationship of nature versus nurture. Hypothetically, the study went like this. Take identical twins, separate them at birth, and have each twin be raised in a different environment. Identical twins have the same genetic material, so the only thing that differs between the two of them is their environment. And then you could look back and see um, how the two people are similar or different. Um, of course, you would never think of doing that experiment in real life. I mean, how horrible would it be for you to be born a twin and to be separated from your twin at birth and never be told of them? Unfortunately, this study did occur in the U.S., in New York City. Uh, there's a movie out about it now. Um, and the movie is called Three Identical Strangers. You see the three men in the picture at the top? Uh, they're triplets. They were born um, in New York, put up for adoption, separated, and placed in three different kinds of families. One was placed in a middle-class family that had a very authoritarian, authoritative, no, authoritarian structure. Um, one was placed in a poor family that was very loving, and the third was placed in a rich family that was just uninvolved with their children. Um, each year, the, ex the researchers who conducted this study, without approval, by the way, but the researchers who conducted this study visited each child and ran a number of uh, tests on them. Um, and the boys never knew about what would happen, what had happened until one of them went to college. Their first day at college, imagine you're walking across campus and people come up to you and say, Hi, George, but your name isn't George. Hey, George, how you doing? Good to see you, George. You're thinking, why do all these people think I'm George? And then someone runs up to you and says, oh my God, you have a twin. That's how they found out. Uh, it was in the newspaper, and then from the newspaper article, they found out, no, actually, they were triplets. Uh, the families and these young men were horrified when they found out that they had been essentially guinea pigs on an experiment of the role of nature and nurture and development. Um, unfortunately, for complicated reasons that I fully don't understand, Yale University has the results of those studies and will not make them available to these men. But how horrible. Okay, that's the end of mini lecture 2.1. Come back for 2.2.